So today is the 29th of March, 2021, and we are commencing our lectures of COVID insolvency. We'll continue from where we stopped with administration, and hopefully we should enter into receivership. Yes, let me hear Mr. Sufi. Yes, sir. You did say that if a director, if CAC requests a director to call for a meeting yes. or to obtain a court order for AGM, mm. it will not be recognized as AGM for the previous year. Okay, is it so, under meetings? Yes, sir. Meetings, okay, yes, go on. Then, so, an AGM that is called by CAC is mm. not recognized as AGM for the previous year. Yeah. Is that it? Yes, yes. I will look at it. And, okay. I will look at the section what again? I will check it and, yes. and revert. Yes. Thank you. Okay, sir. Then, I have an idea of what you are saying, but I have to check it. Okay, go ahead. And then in UK, mm. that no more default obligation to hold AGMs. No more so default, yes. So companies can decide not to hold AGMs and do spot free. What happens when shareholders and frauds, and again, what happens when shareholders and uh, proxy attend the same meeting? Will the two of them be able to vote? Okay. Yes. Let me take the second. Yes, sir. Well, only one person will be able to vote. Yes. Only so what, what I mean is that sometimes I might ask uh, APAM to go and uh, represent me because I will not be free. Yes. And then just maybe while the meeting is going on, what kept what was to keep me out? Yes. Now events have overtaken that. Yes. And I rush down to say I want to be part and part of Ideally, uh, ideally she should step <laughs> down so you will take over. Ideally, you understand. Okay. You are the shareholder. You appointed the person as your proxy. Okay. Let's assume voting has not commenced. Yes. Uh, so when you now come in, it's time for voting. So you can you can take over from the person. But go away, please push this thing forward so that my voice um, will, will, will enter the you can push it closer. Okay, so the one about defaults and that in the UK. Yes, sir. I think that must relate to probably private companies, definitely public companies in the UK must hold AGMs, you understand? And the same applies in Nigeria now. The private company, particularly if it's a small company, is not mandated yes, sir. Yes, to hold an annual general meeting. So, but if it's a public company, it must hold an AGM. Any other question before we dive in? No questions, okay. so. We started looking at administration of companies last week. And uh, where did we stop, please? Effects of administration. OK. okay what we're going to speak today is what he does. Yes. His powers of an administrator. OK. His powers external and internal, the termination and the replacement. OK. Good. So we've already talked about the effect of administration. Can somebody help us? Effect of administration, what is the implication when it happens? When a company goes into administration, what is the effect? It dismisses. And no, you have just, let me hear from you. Okay, thank you, sir. Then, then the position. Oh. Eh? Mm -hmm. What else? My daughter, you have not been coming to the class. Yes, sir. Are you sure? I hope so. Okay. Yes, it suspends or dismisses. What else? Who else? Oh. Yes, my dear, there it is. Receiver appointed by a charge holder will have to do things that he has to do about the last Yes, yes. Some other person should help him, <coughs> help our young sister here. <laughs> the effects of a company going into administration. Okay, so let's jump, please look it up, check it up. Let's look at the, I've already talked about restrictions on uh, uh, appointment. No, sir. I've talked about effect of administration. Yes. 
And I said, yes, among other things, I've talked about the section 480, that no steps shall be taken to enforce security over the company's property to repossess goods and all that. Have I not talked about that? Yes, sir. Yes, Good. So now let's look at, let's rush quickly and see what he does. So remember that the administrator is appointed to take the front seat and to manage the company with the intention of rescuing it and handing it over back again to the members. We talked about three objectives for administration. Can somebody help us? <laughs> quickly, quickly, I was going through the, your feedback. Some people say when you ask questions like this, we have phobia. Don't use, when you're answering the feedback, don't say we, say I. <laughs> eh, don't put yourself in other people's category. I have phobia, why will you have phobia? Me, I don't have phobia. Imagine. <laughs> You are in my class and you are having phobia. You've not gone to the outside world, though. Uh -huh. Yeah, you're already having phobia. Yes, help me. Quickly, sir, quickly. Uh, just uh, the, the function of the administrator to ensure that the creditors are paid off. Yes, we said there are three objectives. The, name, the objective, this man is appointed to manage the affairs of the company in order to achieve either of three objectives. Number one. Hmm? Corporate rescue, number two. Thank you, my son. Some people are repenting. My children are repenting. Yes, yes, yes. The second one. That is the third objective. Good, good. Number two. Yes. I was going through your feedback. I was just laughing. Some people say, when you call some people by their names, you make us feel left out. How will I? <laughs> you are the one that said it. You that said it. <laughs> Number one, I can't know the name of everybody. Is it possible? No. Uh -huh. That's possible. Yeah, it is, of course. Number two, when you participate in the class, the lecturer will know you. Is it also? Yes, sir. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Uh -huh. You are carrying your bag. You are going. One student rushes to carry the bag. Another one says, good day, sir. And the one that carries your bag, or you, have, you get to know the person's name. It's, yes. it's natural thing, so you draw close. Don't say you are feeling left out. I know her name, Derry, because she's involved. Apart from the fact her father was also our student here. But I know a number of you because you have drawn close. Look at Beko, where he has drawn close. He has even spent all the day in my house. Mm -hmm. So you can also draw close. Is it not so? Yes, sir. My house is open. My hands are open. But don't stay from far. Don't stay from far and be writing that when you call a Sufi by name, I feel left out. Don't feel left out. I am here for you. I'm here for you. Eh? <laughs> My house is a protocol. Can we continue? They go and reach a spent holiday My house two years ago. I hope they will come again. Okay, let's move on. So second objective is to pursue is to pursue the interests of all the creditors, and I emphasize that a lot. Pursue the interests of all the creditors because if you prioritize, if you prioritize the and secure secured or preferential creditors, then the unsecured creditors will suffer. So the second objective. If you cannot pursue corporate rescue, then pursue an objective for the benefit of all the creditors. It is if number one and number two cannot be achieved that you can now step down to number three of prioritizing asset realization for the purpose of distribution. In which case you are now looking at very similar to receivership, which we are going to talk about. So when he's appointed, I said he could be appointed in three ways. Three basic ways. Number one, by the courts. Number two? Teacher. Number two? Excel, excellent. And number three? Members in a general meeting. Members in a general meeting. That is the company or the directors. The first instance, it could be appointed by the court upon the application of the creditors of the company itself and uh, I think of the liquidator as well. You know, so when he's appointed, the first thing he's now meant to do, the first thing he's required to do is to, is to obtain information about the company, obtain information about the company, which the managers, the officers of the company are meant to submit to him. As he takes over, the law requires 
or mandates the officers or employees or promoters of the company, as the case may be, to submit to him a statement of affairs, a statement of affairs that this is how this company has been and this is where we are to are currently. So the statement of affairs is meant to give him a comprehensive overview of the situation of the company. This is where we are. These are our credit, these are our debts, these are our assets, these are our liabilities. Are you with me? Yes. It is after he has gotten this information, he is now required to make a proposal. Make a proposal on how he intends to administer the company in order to get it going. On how he intends to get the company back on its foot. And you see that in sections 484 to 486. 484 to 486. Again, it's required to perform his functions as quickly and efficiently as is reasonably practicable. 445. As quickly and as efficiently as is reasonably practicable. Are you with me? Yes. As quickly and as efficiently as is. So, like I said, time is of the essence. It doesn't have more than 12 months. You know, it does not have more than 12 months. So, it's not appointed to work forever. It's a, it's a temporary measure to rescue the company and hand it back to the directors. And so as at the moment is, 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 uh, is appointed, then he's meant to prepare this proposal and submit it to the company, submit it to CAC, submit it to the creditors of the company that this, these are my plans and this is what I intend to do to get the company going. After that, it's also mandated to call an initial creditors uh, meeting. You'll see that in my slide uh, under section 488. It's required to call an ICM or an initial creditors meeting. This meeting is to be held within 42 days after the company enters into administration. So you can see that time is of the essence. It's meant to call that meeting and table the proposal before the creditors, before the creditors. 42 days. Yes, please. However, you should also note when he may not have to call for that meeting, if it's of the opinion that the company is solvent or that it has insufficient property to enable a distribution to be made to unsecured creditors, he will not have to call for that uh, meeting. Also, under section 489, if he doesn't call for the meeting, the creditors can proceed to requisition it. The creditors can proceed to requisition the same meeting. And the role of the meeting is to approve the proposal, to approve the proposal. If they refuse to approve the proposal and he revises it and they still refuse to, to approve the revision, then the court will order that his job comes to an end is the, the the administration will cease to have effect because anything the administrator is going to do will definitely require the consent and approval of the creditors because remember that the company is indebted the company is indebted to creditors and so they take the front seat even though corporate rescue is the objective in order to capture the interest of members as well as creditors members of the company have to take the back seat at this stage. So if it's going to call an initial meeting, the focus is not the members, but the, uh, and the creditors of the company. So please see section 491 and 492. Failure to approve the proposal. I said it will lead to, among other things, the court may order that the administration shall cease to have effect. Excuse me. Yes, please. Uh, you did say that the low-income employees in the company yes. are weak creditors. Yes, and they are prioritized. And they are prioritized. Yes. So, when calling for the meeting of uh, creditors, will he not see, call will them? He, will he call them? No, sir. Or their representatives? He will not call them or their representatives. Uh, where they come in, sir, where they come in is with respect to distribution of assets. Okay. You understand? You don't need to bring them at the point of corporate management, either by the members or by the creditors. But if we eventually decide to liquidate the company, 
then the interests of these employees will, 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 will be preferred. So they are taken as preferential creditors. Are you with me? Yeah. So in the order of priority, when we are sharing the assets, the, the law statute says you must prioritize them. You know, so no matter what, what is happening, they are already secured to some extent because the law says if we have 100 naira and want to share that 100 naira, they will take first in order of um, priority. Yes. Okay. Can we continue? Excellent. Okay, so please notice, in, in, if you read, I would like you to read these sections. Uh, sections 5, 4, 449 or 434 there about, I think it's 440 or there about to, to 549. You know, so about those sections. So please take your time and read them. In the course of reading, you will discover that the, the, the administrator has several duties to the courts and he has several obligations to report to the members of the company from time to time or the creditors or the Corporate Affairs Commission. So please, I want you to note all the notifications, all the sections. Note them at the back of your mind where the law says he is to respond or is to report back to Corporate Affairs Commission, is to report to the court as the case may be and to make certain uh, filings. The 440 to 4, uh, that should be 458. 5, 549 or thereabouts. 549. Now, please, for the powers of the administrator, see section 496. For the powers of the administrator, please see section 496. Section 496. Where is Best and uh, Annabelle, Annabelle de Young? They are not here. Okay. Very, 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 very unusual. Okay, can we proceed? It's well. Okay, 496. Section 496. Are you with me? So 496 outlines the powers of the company of the administrator. You also see more of his powers in the 11th schedule of the act. The 11th schedule of the act. I will run through some of them. I will just run through some of them. So he may do anything necessary or expedient for the management of the affairs of the business and property of the company. And in addition, he shall exercise the powers outlined in the 11th schedule. He may remove a director or appoint one. He may sell property subjected to a floating charge. He may call for a meeting of members or creditors and apply to the court for directions as the case may be. He may take possession of the company's property. He may sell property by public auction or private contract. He may borrow money. So these are elaborate powers. He may appoint professionals like lawyers, accountants, engineers, as the case may be, he may embark on litigation. So he may sue or defend actions on behalf of the company. He may refer matters to arbitration. He may ensure the business. And so just take your time and look at there are over 30 of them, or at least 25 parts of the administrator. So for example, if you see in the exam or in the law school, because it's not just here now, it could be in law school, what are the parts of the administrator, you should be able to at least bring out seven of them so you can do virtually everything that the directors of the company can do. But in this case, he's even more powerful than the directors because he can sack them. Remember that when he's appointed, the directors are not automatically sacked, but he can sack them. He can also appoint directors to replace a director that he has sacked. You know, so he's very, 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 very powerful. Please, let's continue. We have to look at receivership today. So please look at sections 507 and 508. F sections 507 and 508. Rights and privileges of secured creditors during administration. So please see section 507. Rights and privileges of secured creditors during administration. Among other things, if you remember that the administrator, he takes possession of the company's property. So if I had used these assets, the assets of the company, to secure my funds, when the administrator comes in, 
a moratorium goes into force, my right to enforce my security by the realization of property is suspended in abeyance. In abeyance. Mr. Sufi, you can take that. So that this man, so that this man that is coming on board can now manage the company and get it floating. In the course of this management, he could decide to sell this device. But this device was what was used to secure Colocolo's money. So definitely it had to be skipping. Because this was his security. What Kama now says to give him some level of protection is to provide that where property is disposed of. Are you with me? And the administrator uses the money from that disposition to acquire another asset. This man will still have priority in the event that this property, that the property he acquires, is going to be dissipated, is going to be sold subsequently, and the money is distributed. Let me take it again. These assets and these assets have been used to secure his funds. He's a floating charge holder, so definitely his rights over the assets of the company, the hoover, the, is the ambulatory. But an administrator has been appointed, and his rights against these assets have now been kept in abeyance. The administrator decides to sell this, 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 probably in order to realize a profit. If in the course of doing that, he now acquires more, he now gets cash. And tomorrow, that property, that company is going to be wound up. When we are sharing that cash, remember it's no longer, it doesn't have any security again because security assets have been dissipated. Those funds that have now been realized from the sale of these assets, when those funds will be distributed, because it's a floating charge holder, he will still have priority over an unsecured creditor. That's what am I saying. Secondly, if he was a fixed charge holder and this was the only asset that was used to secure his money, the administrator now comes on board and now decides to sell this. Kama says he cannot sell it unless he obtains the consent of that man because it's a fixed charge. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Yes. And if he obtains the consent of the man and then he goes ahead to dispose of the property, when the, 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 the proceeds from that acquisition are going to be shared, he will still have priority. So as a fixed charge holder, he will have priority over a floating charge holder and over every unsecured creditor. So that is one way through which Kama has sought to confer some uh, protection on the secured creditor. creditor. Secured sure. creditor. Yes, please. That these are secured creditors. Yes. They want their money. Yes. When the company is a going concern, yes, sir. they get their interest and they get they can their um, principal is also secured. Mm. But now there is problem. Yes. There's an administrator. Is the administrator going to be focusing on paying the interest or paying only the capital that they uh, that okay. they are doing? He will focus on everything. Uh, yes, everything. Because that is his entitlement according to contract. His principal sum and definitely his capital. But if he's unable to do that, if he's unable to do that, then the company will have to go into liquidation. And if the company goes into liquidation, the brutal fact is that the fixed charge holder will be settled completely before the floating charge holder will now come. And it's also possible that even the fixed charge holder may not be paid. Because if the company is liquidated, the assets may not be sufficient to pay everybody. And again, if as a fixed charge holder, the asset that was originally used to secure its funds has been damaged or sold or destroyed, then at that stage, he will have to go back and wait until every other secured creditor has been compensated. Are you with me? Yeah, because at that stage, that is one of the risks of using a fixed charge. Because once you lose that particular uh, asset that was used, then your security is highly jeopardized. Unlike the floating charge, 
where it can move from A, B, C, D to E, and so you can still uh, you still have a lot of things to fall back on. You want to say something? Yes. The scientific situation is like the emphasis is on the fifth chart. Administration. administration. On the administration. Now what happened to the? No, it's on the floating charge holder. On the floating charge. What yes. happened to the equity shareholder? Equity shareholder, he goes. He goes to the bank. That's why he is called an equity shareholder. He, he bears the risk with the company. The idea is that he was the person who appointed the managers in the first place, the directors. And now this company has been managed to the point of insolvency. So he should not even, we should not even hear him as much as possible because invariably he causes this problem. The people that are highly jeopardized at this level are the uh, creditors of the company. It is after we have satisfied them, if anything is left, that the equity will fall back to the shareholders. So it's not as though their interest or their voice is entirely uh, and discountenanced. But as much as possible, he takes the back seat. The creditors now take the front seat. And the focus for administration is the floating charge holder. The focus is not the fixed charge holder because, like I said, he has a fixed asset that is highly secured. You know, the, the whole idea of administration, the process of administration, is, is a follow up from the receiver manage, manager uh, arrangement, which we are going to talk about now. Please, let's continue. Sir, sir, yes, sorry, please. Sir. Yes, please. We are learning. Yes, yes, of course. And definitely, some of us might have retainership. Mm. Consultancy. Yes. No, there's no company that is uh, going concern that will be planning to be liquidated. Yes. But if in the venture in the contract of uh, with a debenture holder or yes. a creditor, is it possible? Because so even at the police station, when people come and say he's owing me, I want my money, he must pay the interest. When we know that it is even practically impossible. Yes. Very, very difficult to pay the capital. Yes. We are not talking of the interest. Is it possible now, as a legal practitioner, you are to come, you come and sit here, prosper? You are distracted. Come and sit here. Sorry, sir. Continue. Will it be okay for the legal practitioner to yes. put in the contract? Yes, sir. In the event of insolvency, yes, please. Or going to administration. The company is not going to think of your interest. We are going to facilitate the payment of your capital. Would that be Yes, possible? everything is possible by contract. So it's possible. But it's highly unlikely. But it's possible. Because it's a contract. Provided it's not illegal and it is entered into voluntarily, it's possible. But for company law, for company law, because here we are dealing with a company and uh, it's highly improbable, you know, but it's possible. Can we continue? Yes. Sir. So we are looking at how we are looking at. Yes, please. Yes, sir. The point I want to make is, if uh, it is practically impossible to offset the capital, and then why give it to the person of also getting interest? Because we are also facing such a particular situation. Okay. Uh, yes, somebody did not be cooperative, and a uh, lot of issues came up. Yes. And we are seeing that. Uh, there's no way to even offset the capital. Yes. And uh, some persons have been putting their capital, they're also insisting on getting interest. On getting the interest. Mm -hmm. And we are saying that, look, mm -hmm. the interest, you cannot get to the mm -hmm. But the thing is practically going to put up the service. Yes. And so you take your capital and go. That is where we are now talking about liquidation. You know, if the company <coughs> is going into insolvent liquidation, mm -hmm. that means we are signaling that the company is dying. Nothing can be done. And so, at that level is to take anything you can get. You understand? If you put 100 Naira and they are giving you 85 Naira, you should even be thankful. Mm. But for administration, we are looking at a case whereby the company, we are not expecting the company to die. We are expecting the company to be rescued. Bank, yes. yes. You know, we are expecting the company to be rescued. And so if it's going to be rescued, there's no reason why the creditors should not fully expect what belongs to them. The only thing is that the law is now saying that the creditors will have to exercise some patience, hence the moratorium. They will have to exercise some patience for 12 months while the administration is in force. Certain rights that belong to them cannot be enforced. 
until administration is over. But if the administration succeeds and the company is gotten, it gets back on its foot, footing again, why shouldn't the creditors uh, be fully compensated? That is the idea. And I talked to, I talked to us about Apple, and I said that Apple had almost gone into insolvency, but it, it came back on its foot, and today it's one of the most profitable companies in the world. Yes, please. In this case, what is the advantage and disadvantage of the floating charge and system? Excellent. The floating charge, what are the advantages it has over the, the fixed charge? We talked about the fact that from the perspective of the company, the floating charge allows the company to be able to trade with those assets, you know, and to be able to profit from them. That is one major advantage because if you use this asset as a fixed charge to raise money, and the charge holder says you can't use it to run your business. Let's assume you're in the cinema business, you know, and this is what you use to play films, and uh, people come to watch and you make money. Once you secure it with a fixed charge, the fixed charge holder may even take this asset to his house and keep it there for safekeeping. He may insist that you take this asset and drop it with a third party, a bank or, or you know, a third party. And so, this asset that ordinarily would, would have generated profits for you is now encumbered from the perspective of the company. So it is a major and drawback. But for the floating charge, I have used it to secure your money, but I can be playing my films and be collecting money from people. I can be using this laptop and be doing my business center work and be generating funds. That is the advantage of the fixed charge. It offers the advantage of flexibility. You know, and secondly, for the floating charge holder again, like I said, for the fixed charge holder, this asset could diminish in value. That is a major risk. It could diminish in value. It could be destroyed. It could be dissipated. Anything could happen. Once that happens, he can't jump to this laptop because if he jumps to this laptop, he may discover that this laptop has already been used to secure another person's funds. If he comes to this bag, he discovers that we have also used this bag to secure another person's funds. He now has to go and wait until all the secured creditors have been satisfied before he can now, you know, be paid. But for the floating charge, if this asset is diminished, it doesn't really worry because he can still jump to this one. So the floating charge is usually over all of the company's property, or a substantial part of it, or it's on called capital. It's undertaking book debts and all that. So that is the advantage. So it has advantages for both the, the uh, uh, fixed charge holder and the floating charge holder. But for the fixed charge holder, if the company, provided the asset is secure, even if the company is going into insolvency, it doesn't have so much problem because his, his focus is on this asset. His focus is on this asset. The problem is with the floating charge holder who doesn't really have any particular thing to lay hold on. And so it is in his interest that the company prospers because he has interest in all of his undertaking. And that is why the law now allows him to appoint a receiver manager. And that same idea has now been brought forward to the administration procedure. So let's continue and look at, we are looking at some of the protection that the law confers upon holders of the upon secured creditors, upon secured creditors. And number three, we are saying that the proposals of the administrator, I told you that when he's appointed, he is going to bring proposals on how he intends to get the company going. Are you with me? Yes. Good. Among other things, his proposals are not to include any action which may affect the right of a secured creditor of the company, 